Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my voice. Couldn't be a worse time to lose my voice, but hopefully I'll be okay. I'm absolutely honored by the very kind invitation. I'd like to um, sincerely thank the organizers for the opportunity, not only to present today, but also to visit the magical city of Dubai yet again. Um, I've lost count of the number of times I've been to this wonderful city. But for those of you who have never been to Dubai, I strongly recommend that you take full advantage of the many wonders this beautiful city has to offer. So, <clears throat> excuse me, to be quite honest with you, I didn't hesitate for a moment when I was invited to give this talk. I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about. Because for the past 10 years, um, since uh, we established our lab, um, we've seen many wonders that spring forth when digging into the genome of our local population. And so my goal of this talk is really to share with you some of these exciting wonders and discoveries and hopefully convince you that there's much, much more to the Arab variome than the simple stereotype of being, you know, fertile land for novel gene discovery. So let's kick off with a few numbers to see if this works. Great. Um, the Arab population is quite sizable in number. They um, a total almost 400 million. And, uh, even though different Arab communities uh, have a little bit of variability, in general, it's fair to say that Arab families tend to be large in size, tend to be consanguineous, and they tend to have a strong tribal affiliation. And this heritage has left an unmistakable signature in the genome of Arabs. And as you can see here, you see this is the three star. Yeah. Um, so you can see that the inbreeding coefficient in the Arab genome is much higher than other world populations. You can also see the strong founder effect where almost 40% of recessive mutations that we deal with are actually founder mutations as opposed to private mutations. And also, you see the, um, the poor representation of the Arab variome in the world databases. So uh, a sizable fraction of the Arab variome is either very rare or completely absent in, in public databases, as you see here. The implications of this clinically are really profound. So intuitively, obviously, the most obvious um, uh, implication is the abundance of autosomal recessive diseases. So wherever you see, uh, you look, you see an abundance of recessive diseases over other classes of monogenic diseases, and this also applies to things like intellectual disability, which is in stark contrast with the genetics of intellectual disability in outward populations, where it's almost universally de novo dominant uh, cause, as opposed to more than almost three quarters of the cases being recessive uh, among Arabs. Um, we also see a lot of disorders that are so rare, it's never been described before. Some of them uh, have made it to Omen. Some of them haven't even made it to Omen, even though they've already been published. I guess Omen is uh, overwhelmed with our submissions of these uh, novel genotypes. Um, and also you see this, um, um, the effect of this common heritage. Sometimes you see it limited uh, at the level of tribes, like you know, this, what we call the Shaheen syndrome, in specific tribes from Southern Arabia. And some are truly pan-Arab like the Wittas-Safati syndrome, the Tantami syndrome, and the A83 related intellectual disability syndrome, you see them across all tribes that originate from Arabia. In fact, these two variants alone, these two founder variants alone, account for more than 2% of all cases of intellectual disability uh, among indigenous Arabs. And then, of course, you have the all too common problem, which we'll handle in a minute, um, that Arab patients have um, unfairly paying the price of not being well represented in public databases where they're very likely to receive a genomic report, the, the West uh, whole genome sequence, normal genome sequencing, where the variant is unknown, of unknown significance and groups who have shown that the vast majority of these can easily be reclassified as denied um, if we look at the local Arab variant. Um, obviously, I'm not here to just tell you about the challenges. I'm an optimist by nature. Um, so we can talk about a lot of opportunities. Um, I like to think of these challenges as opportunities. 
We could talk, for example, about how we could turn the diagnostic dilemma I told you about in the patients who want to counseling with their parents, uh, for example, upside down, such that we get a higher diagnostic rate compared to the rest of the world. I could also tell you about the opportunity to exploit the abundance uh, of autosomal recessive causes of genetic diseases in order to offer what we call molecular autopsy by proxy among parents who lost children with unknown genetic diseases or to launch nationwide expanded carrier screening. And we are making uh, strong uh, major strides in all of these areas. But instead, I decided to think of an opportunity that has a global relevance, not only as a courtesy to our international audience, but also to uh, show you that the Arab variable is a tremendous tool that could be very helpful at the global scale. So let me show you how we believe that the Arab variable is a tool that can help us address the most challenging uh, questions we have in the area of clinical genomics. And by that, I'm really referring to the issue of variant interpretation, the biggest bottleneck we're facing right now in the delivery of clinical genomics. So, how could error variable help us? Well, um, let's first examine the current state of affairs. We do know quite confidently that a bunch of variants are benign, we're able to classify them as such, and a bunch of variants are clearly pathogenic. Again, we're comfortable with that. But there's many, many more variants that we're unable to classify properly. So how do we get to a future where we're able to shrink that unknown to a minimum? Remember, I said minimize, and I didn't say eliminate. We will always get novel variants introduced in the human gene pool, thanks to our mutable human genome. But at least we could minimize it, so we can have clear answers to our patients most of the time. Well, if you present this problem um, to a data scientist, perhaps the first answer that data scientist will give you is, oh, that's easy. Let's just do artificial intelligence, right? So AI, or artificial intelligence, um, could solve this big problem. And to their credit, artificial intelligence has really come a long, long way from the early days uh, of its development. It has uh, it, it been the world champion, human champion in chess, Jeopardy, and most recently, the game Go. And I don't know if you're following the evolution of artificial intelligence, but this was a landmark uh, this is definitely the evolution of artificial intelligence where the AI is capable of learning the game, the complex game Go, on its own. It kept playing itself until it mastered it and it beat all the world's champion in, in this game without human intervention whatsoever. So great, why don't we use artificial intelligence to help us with this? Here's the catch. Unlike the game Go, which has a very clear set of rules, Variant interpretation is nothing like that. So, variant interpretation is a very complex process. And even though we like to think that we've come up with some rules, anybody who works with variant interpretation would understand that we have, for all, for each of these rules, we have many, many exceptions. Which makes it really, really difficult for an AI to take over. Um, we don't consider every common variant to be denied, right? We have exceptions. We don't consider the truncated variant to be pathogenic, to have exceptions, and so on and so forth. And so, it seems to me that the solution is really to um, accrue a critical mass of data where we do understand these rules and their exceptions in order for us to reach that critical stage where in the AI, uh, an AI solution would be possible. And obviously, the way we can accrue this empirical data is through a global effort. It's a global endeavor. Each one of us is doing his or her best to collect those empirical data because nothing is as important as observing the, the, the phenotype in an actual patient and knowing his or her um, um, uh, genotype. Now, what I will try to convince you is that the error variable is an extremely helpful tool that will accelerate the accrual of, of, of these empirical data, and that will help us reach that um, goal of reaching a critical stage where an AI solution would be possible to solve this problem. So, 
what kind of magic does the Arab variable offer in order to accelerate the process? Uh, I will focus on one particular um, feature of the Arab variable, which is autozygosity. Remember, I told you about the inbreeding coefficient being very high. And in a sense, when we talk about the powerful autozygosity, we're talking about two powerful phenomena that are gifted to us by autozygosity. One is the power of homozygosity, enhanced homozygosity, and the power of that. And um, just to remind you, uh, when we talk about homozygosity, we're talking about the dual inheritance of a common ancestral faculty type as a result of consanguinity, which has to be uh, all sides, which is quite common uh, among Arabs, uh, or even through the tribal affiliation. So not only do you get enhanced homozygosity, but you're able to trace it thanks to the process of recombination. So you know exactly where your variant is, even if you don't have a clue what that variant might be, especially if you have a favorable pedigree structure like this. So let's put these two features to test and see how they can be extremely helpful in solving the mystery of variant interpretation. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind, I know, is um, Novelty discovery. I'm not going to disappoint you, so let's get this out of the way. Let's start with it. Um, and I would like to put it in perspective to see what we mean by high throughput. It is truly high throughput. It's amazing by high throughput. So, to put it in perspective, uh, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this flagship project in the UK. It's an incredible uh, uh, project in the UK called the DDD project. It's really a role model for national, nationwide uh, organization and collaboration. Um, and they published the results of their data on children and families with intellectual disability and development of the brain. And I want you to pay attention to the numbers. We're talking in combination more than 7,000 families. They were able to identify 14,000 genes. Okay? These are the 14 genes that they published in that paper from 7,000 families, right? Now, look at this. In this paper, we simply looked at 133, not 1,000, not 500, 133 families that are pre screened for novel genes or enriched for novel gene discovery. We were able to identify 69 novel genes, okay? And even if you didn't have any pre selection whatsoever, like in this paper, we we simply screen every child with developmental delay and collection disability. In just 300 families, we were able to identify 35 novel genes. And more recently, in this paper where we studied the first 1,000 families who were referred for molecular testing for all kinds of suspected genetic diseases, we were able to highlight more than 70 novel genes. Now that's actually, and just to put it in perspective, remember, the minute we identify a gene and establish it as a novel disease gene, we are making it easy for patients around the world who have variants in those genes to get a proper molecular classification upon which clinical decisions can be based. But by the same token, that power of homozygosity allows us to reclassify variants the other way around, right? And so, because autozygosity is like the powerhouse of generating homozygous variants. We are much more likely than anywhere else in the world to observe homozygous individuals for variants claimed to be pathogenic. And if these individuals lack the phenotype claimed to be part of those um, variants, then we could at least challenge the pathogenicity of those variants. And that's precisely what we did here. We were able to reclassify thousands of variants previously claimed to be pathogenic at the AGMD database or the Clinfar database. <coughs> now, here's the catch with this approach, and I'll explain it in, in a few illustrative examples. The technique is really exciting. So, many of you are probably familiar with the tricky story of a condition called thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome, or TAR. This is a condition you never get as a result of homozygosity. You always get it as a result of compound heterozygosity for one uh, truncating variant in RBN8A and one mild variant in the same gene, right? Now, if you have parents 
who are both carriers of the lung failure, you're not going to counsel them, oh, you have a 25% risk of having an affected child. We know this because homozygotes for the mild variant are completely healthy, right? And we all, the only way we know this is because of, of direct observation of homozygotes in the general population. Now, in a way, we were lucky with this example because even though that mild variant is low frequency, it was frequent enough for us to observe those Q squared, you know, those homozygotes in, in large databases. But just imagine, what if your variant was so rare, you're going to have a prohibitive uh, uh, sample size in order to get those Q squared? That's where autozygosity comes in handy because it doesn't operate based on Q squared, it operates in a completely different manner. And I'll show you one illustrative example uh, to make my point. So, this is um, a condition called Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome. It's a condition, it's a, um, a syndromic form of bone marrow failure. Right? And this is, this guy, this uh, uh, splicing variant, is the single most causative mutation in Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome. So, for all intents and purposes, I think most of you would have probably felt comfortable counseling carrier parents that, oh, you have a 25% risk of having a child with Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome. Right? Um, now, remember, this variant is so rare, there's no way you're going to see homozygotes in public databases, even as large as exact database, for example. However, in our database, which is nearly two orders of magnitude, smaller than NOMAD, we were able to see two homozygotes for this variant, right? And so, again, because of that autozygosity. So we figured, great, we diagnosed two children with schwarzman diamond syndrome, except when we evaluated them, they did not have any feature of schwarzman diamond syndrome. How is that possible? Well, turns out, if you look closely, this variant was never observed in any patient with schwarzman diamond syndrome in homozygosity. It was always in compound heterozygosity with a more severe mutation. And when we did the RT-PCR, we showed that this variant was, in fact, a leaky splicing mutation. Right? So you can't imagine how difficult it is for an AI to figure this on its own, right? So we really need these empirical data in order for the AI to understand the exceptions. Now, just like this homozygosity trick can, can unmask the um, mild face of certain variants, it could also show us an unexpected severe phenotype for other variants that we thought we knew pretty well. And I'll show you one example to make my point here. Um, this is a condition we're very interested in in the labs called microcephalic primordial dwarfism. And we were quite excited when we identified a novel gene for this condition involved in DNA damage repair called Donson. I was contacted by a colleague, Andrew Jackson, uh, from the UK, and he told me, oh, we independently also identified Donson. Why didn't we join hands and publish together? And so we added uh, our two cohorts together. And I want you to pay attention to this guy, this minus nine variant for a moment, okay? Anyways, in collaboration with uh, uh, Grant Stewart, who's an expert in DNA damage repair, uh, we showed that Donson is really important in the replication fork, and loss of Donson causes significant DNA damage, which we think is the mechanism for premodal dwarfism. So everything made sense, paper was tentatively accepted, happy story, right? Now, at the same time, completely independently, my other postdoc was working on something we thought was completely different. This was an embryonic lethal phenotype characterized by very severe skeletal dysplasia. And to our pleasant surprise, just before the paper was uh, officially accepted, we were able to map this disease to the exact same minus 9 variant that I told you about. So wait a second. This has nothing to do with primordial dwarfism that I showed you. Turns out that the story was very similar. The cases that had the minus 9 severe splicing mutation always had it in compound heterozygosity with a milder um, variant, and that's why they, the phenotypic expression was that microcephalic primordial dwarfism. But if you're homozygote for this very severe splicing variant, then you get this very lethal phenotype. Okay, 
Um, another trick that comes with homozygosity, excuse me. Again, for the latecomers, I apologize. I lost my voice yesterday, which was really a terrible time. I hope you're not bothered by the weird tone of my voice. Um, another advantage of homozygosity, of autozygosity, as a factory that keeps homozygosing variant, is that it could homozygose so many pathogenic alleles per disease, var per disease gene. So you end up having an allelic series for each of these disease genes. And these could be extremely informative. And I'll show you a few examples of what I mean by that. I like this example, even though it's, it's already published, I like to talk about it, because it was really a huge surprise to us. Apologize for the graphic nature of the pictures, but this is a very bizarre syndrome, very rare, called Neolaxova syndrome. Very, very bizarre dysmorphology syndrome, embryonic, embryonic lethal in the vast majority of cases. And we were shocked when we discovered that the causal mutations for Neolaxova syndrome were in a gene known as PHGDH, phosphoglyceride dehydrogenase. Why was that surprising? Because PHGDH had been known for a while to be the underlying cause of a relatively mild inborn error of metabolism that manifests as nonspecific developmental delay, intellectual disability, sometimes microcephaly. So it turns out that our mutations are severe loss of function mutations in this gene, and you end up having this very uh, bizarre uh, phenotype. And again, as I said, you know, it would be very, very difficult for our AI friend, the artificial intelligence friend, to have figured out this connection between the two because they really have nothing in common, at least on the face of it. That was published, so let me show you something we haven't published yet. This is um, another example of the power of allelic series. This is a condition, very rare condition, called carey toriello syndrome, toriello carey syndrome, characterized by cerebellar hypoplasia, genesis of corpus callosum, short neck, and pure robain sequence, uh, which I first learned about from Owen Brennert right in the back when I was a resident at Georgetown. I'm really glad he's here, so we're going to catch up. Anyways, um, turns out that this condition is caused by mutation in PGAP3, which is known to cause something completely different. It's called the uh, hyperphosphatasia mental retardation syndrome, as you see on this slide. And so these allelic series can be really, really helpful in interpreting the variants. I mean, you can imagine how an AI solution would have simply ignored the variant in that gene, thinking that it had nothing to do with the phenotype, right? OK, now, another amazing advantage of enhanced homozygosity is the fact that we sometimes observe homozygote variants in genes that are strictly known to be dominant. And what, and what that means um, uh, for variant interpretation is really very, very significant. Let's go over a couple of examples to make the point. Um, let's ask our artificial intelligence friend to interpret the following scenario. You have a clearly deleterious variant, right? It's a truncating variant in a gene known to cause a dominant eye condition called target macular dystrophy. Except that individual is completely healthy. No eye involvement whatsoever. Obviously, our AI friend is going to jump to the conclusion, maybe it's an unpenetrance case, right? So you would counsel the family, well, uh, that individual at least, that you have a 50% chance of passing it on to your children, and they may or may not have the disease. That's how you would have counseled them, right? Except through direct observation, we can tell with confidence that this is a genuinely recessive variant. And we know this from observing it in actual human patients who have nothing to do with target macular dystrophy. They have something completely different. They have a condition called Jokerlund-Larsen syndrome, and they're all caused by homozygotes in this gene, and their parents are completely normal. So now you know how to interpret a variant in this gene in someone who's normal. It's genuinely recessive. Very, very different from the other counseling uh, scenario that I told you about. Another more recent example is this. This is a child who was referred to me. His parents just gave up. You know, he has a form of myopathy, and he had every test under the sun, including clinical exome sequencing. And no one could figure out what he had. And I remember writing in my notes after evaluating him that most likely he has a mutation in a novel gene involved in extracellular matrix or ECM remodeling. 
Well, this was because he had striae all over his body, which is not typically something you see with, with myopathies. So it turns out I was 50% right and 50% wrong. I was right that the gene, when we did our own analysis, the gene was involved in extracellular matrix remodeling, but I was wrong. It was not a novel gene after all. It was a very known gene. It's a known gene, FBN2, that causes a dominant condition called contractural arachnodactyly. And it turns out that our homozygous mutation abolishes the secretion signal of FBN2 so it doesn't make it to the extracellular matrix to allow for healthy remodeling. And it turns out that mice that are homozygotes for FBN2 loss of function, they have a very similar myopathy phenotype to the myopathy phenotype we saw in our patients. Again, an AI would have completely ignored that FBN variant thinking it has nothing to do with the dominant phenotype, right? So keep that in mind, and hopefully you can see how all these empirical observations can help us refine the rules and their exceptions. Now, it could be very difficult sometimes to reconcile between, okay, why is this dominant and why is this recessive in the same gene? But sometimes it's elegantly clear. And I love this example. It couldn't be more elegant than this. So this is a child who came to my clinic with very classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And to our surprise, he turned out to be homozygous. cal 5 a one is a strictly dominant gene in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And yet, we see this child who's homozygous for a truncating variant. That made no sense. His parents, who are carriers, are completely disease-free. Turns out we have a very elegant explanation. <coughs> Excuse me. So it turns out our mutation affects a very unique exon in the gene. So Cal5A1 has this gene, a weird gene, two genes, sorry, two exons right next to each other, 64A, 64B. They're too close together, they cannot be spliced together. And so each allele produces two isoforms, one with either 64A or with 64B. You can't have them both. So if you think about it, our patient is not a null for Cal5A1. He's actually haploinsufficient for Cal5A1. And his parents are not haploinsufficient. They're having a 25% reduction, which is more than enough to make them healthy. OK. Um, so before you jump to the conclusion, if you see a healthy individual with a clearly deleterious variant in a known dominant gene, before we jump to the conclusion that this is an example of incomplete penetrance, please consider the alternative uh, uh, um, possibility that this is a genuinely recessive um, phenotype. And in the interest of time, I'll just refer you to this paper. Uh, if you're interested, we publish a lot of examples like that. Okay, before we leave homozygosity, I'd like to say a few words about the uh, phenomena of knockout. Obviously, uh, you know, when you produce, uh, when you homozygose a lot of variants, some of these variants are loss of function, and you end up completely knocking out the function of that gene. Typically, we think of knockouts in the context of Mendelian diseases, uh, be they rare, I mean, that's severe or mild. But I'd like to remind you that we have an entire phenotypic spectrum, that phenotypic spectrum that goes all the way from embryonic lethality all the way to pretty much no phenotype. And unfortunately, I don't have time to show you snapshots uh, from uh, each segment of the phenotypic spectrum, but I'll just show you um, uh, examples of the relevance of the human knockouts to the study of complex diseases. Since part of, uh, of the theme of this conference is complex diseases as well, I want you to leave with the impression that um, these uh, homozygote events can also help us with complex disease genetics as well. And one obvious example is phenocopies, Mendelian phenocopies, where mutation in a single gene could recapitulate your complex phenotype. So this is one quick example of family with children uh, with very, very severe peptic ulcer disease, which we found to have been caused by being uh, completely knocked out for PLA2G4A, which makes perfect sense because this gene is working in the, in the, on, on this side of the pathway that's involved in uh, the response to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So basically, these poor kids were as though were on a very high dose of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, their entire lives. And we're experimenting with prostaglandin to see if we can um, uh, help them 
uh, uh, overcome this, this defect. Um, obviously, we identified a lot of other Mendelian funeral copies, but I'd like to just focus on one in just a couple of minutes to make an important point, and that is SLE. I'll show you why in a minute. SLE, or systemic lupus erythematosus, we were able to identify several families through uh, collaborators in, in Oman, and they were all found to be completely knocked out for a gene called DNA 103, involved in nicking extra DNA, so it makes perfect sense that if they're deficient, they get SLE, right? But I want you to pay attention to the date when we published this, okay? 2011. Why? Because just a few years earlier, there was this big study, on uh, a GWAS study on the genetics of SLE, and one of the loci was attributed to a gene called PXK. And the authors of that paper admitted that PXK doesn't sound like an attractive candidate at all. And now we know what the story was. Turns out their PXK was in linkage equilibrium with our gene. Here's their PXK, here's our DNA 103. And indeed, after we published our paper, there was a follow-up analysis of their data, and they found that indeed their signal originally came from DNA 103 and not PXK. So that got us thinking, maybe we could inform the interpretation of GWAS signals through our knockout work. And again, in the interest of time, I'll just refer you to this paper that we published uh, in which we discuss examples like this. Okay, last part of my talk will be on the power of mapping. We talked a lot about, about home zygosity. Let's talk a little bit about mapping. Obviously, the minute we talk about mapping, people think, aha, uh -huh, you're going to tell us about how you map novel disease genes. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'll show you the power of mapping to address a very fundamental question that keeps us up at night. Let me explain what I mean by this. This is a commentary we published recently in which we expressed concern about the declining number of novel genes that are being discovered despite the extensive use of whole exome sequencing. And obviously a lot of people jump to the conclusion that, okay, we've hit the limit with exome, it's now time to switch to whole genome and find all these non-coding variants that are causing all these mis uh, missed cases. Not so fast. I believe that the proper question we should be asking first before we make that switch is, how often are human diseases caused by mutations in this class, non-coding, non-genic, whatever? To answer this question, we need this enumerator and this denominator. And these are very difficult to get because the, the literature is very biased against uh, uh, the non-coding variants, and obviously we don't have the denominator. So how do we come to uh, a solution for this problem? We figured mapping could be a solution. And by that, I'm referring to the simple concept of why don't we get our hands on every single family that maps to a single locus, and since mapping is completely neutral to the class of variants, then we can ask ourselves, how often do we get variants that are coding or non-coding and answer that question? And that's indeed what we did. So we got 104 families, and here's the good news. We were able to identify the causal variant in 97%, in 101 out of 104. And they were all genic. So that's great. So the first good news is the vast overwhelming majority of recessive um, disease-causing mutations, consanguineous uh, families at least, at least, are within genes. But then we wanted the breakdown of these classes, and it turns out that the good news is the only class that you should miss at the technical level with exome sequencing, other than the presumably non-genic, are those 2% that are so deep in the intron, they're not, they're not going to be uh, captured, right? So technically speaking, should be able to capture 95% of these recessive mutations. But here's the sad news. There are classes that we figured will be missed, not at the capture and sequencing stage, but the interpretation stage, right? So we figured, why don't we put this idea to test? Why don't we look at cases where they're likely to be recessive, they received cl negative clinical exome report, and revisit them? And we were spot on. So out of the 33 families, we were able to identify the cause in 31. That's almost the 95% I told you about. So of course the question you're all going to ask, why were they missed in the first place? It turns out, as we said, it was all about interpretation. So a big chunk of them was because they were in, an, in novel genes. And current algorithms are just so bad in identifying mutations in novel genes. Novel genes are really, really difficult. They're very challenging. Any of you who works 
in this field with a test of this. And we noticed that there's significant depletion of obvious canonical splicing mutations. They were all tricky ones. So in a couple of minutes, I'll just go over a few examples of these cases and how we solve them with the power of mapping to make the point. This is a family with microcephalopimorded dwarfism with negative clinical exome sequencing. And we found that we could easily map them to a single locus in which there is RTTN, in which we identified a plus eight splicing variant. And um, after that, we were able to identify several other families with mutations in this gene. To me, this is not a double whammy. It's like a triple whammy for an AI. Why? Because A, this gene, um, the variant is not a canonical splice site, and we're really bad in interpreting these non-canonical splice sites. B, this gene, if you were to look at the mouse model, would be useless because the mouse model has left-right asymmetry, nothing to do with the microcephalic murder dwarfism. And C, Bill Dobbins had published this gene as a cause of polymicrogyria, which is also very different from the phenotype we're observing. Again, it would have been very, very difficult for an AI to come up with this variant. Uh, but we're hoping these empirical data will help refine it. Here's a variant that's so deep, minus 23. This family had negative whole genome sequencing, which missed this variant. But our record breakers, really these families from a certain area in Saudi Arabia, who all present with Walker-Warburg syndrome, and they're like a nightmare to diagnostic labs. Because no matter what you do for them, it's always negative. And the reason is they all have this founder mutation, almost minus 400 base pairs deep, um, and it causes Walker-Warburg syndrome uh, in, in, in these families. And so we immediately screen for this variant whenever we have a family from that part of the country. Two more variants that are tricky in a different way in just a few seconds. This variant was missed in all of these children because it was consistently predicted to be benign at the amino acid level. But with the power of mapping, we were able to find that this is the most likely variant. And indeed, it turned out to be pathogenic at the RNA level. So who knows how many of these missense variants that we're ignoring because they appear benign, but in fact, they're doing their magic through, through splicing. And finally, this phenotype, band keratopathy, which we found to be caused by, after, you know, with the power of mapping, to be caused by a 3 prime UTR mutation. Again, very difficult class of mutations to interpret, but we were lucky because this variant creates an ARE element, uh, AU-rich uh, um, um, element in, in RNA, which is very important for degrading RNA, sometimes stabilizing RNA. And indeed, we showed that it uh, greatly degrades uh, the, uh, the, the RNA and causes uh, the phenotype. So I'm going to skip that and this. So I hope I was able to show you that Oftentimes, the problem is not with the capture and sequencing. It's at the interpretation stage. So by all means, if you want to ditch exome sequencing and switch to whole genome sequencing, by all means. But if you're expecting this to be your magic solution for the problem of unsolved cases, you will be disappointed. Because if you're using the same algorithm that missed the variant in exome, you will miss it in genome. And I hope I was able to show you a few examples of that. So in conclusion, I hope I was able to convince you that the Arab variome lends itself as a tremendous tool uh, in the interpretation of the human genome for the benefit of all people, really. And my little advice to my colleague uh, researchers in, in Arab countries is that we really owe it to the world to share this uh, tremendous resource. At the very end, I'd like to remind you, the work I presented is obviously not only a team effort, and I thank all the members of my team, but is the result of tremendous collaboration involving countless people, be they patients, scientists, or clinicians, and I just can't fit them in one slide. In fact, I tried, but then I figured I'd be very silly, so I changed my mind, and I'll just thank him from the bottom of my heart for, uh, for their collaboration, funding agencies, and thank you for your attention.